big fan of one thing. Here, I'll give you a hint. Man, I just love Street Fighter. Out of all the companies in the game industry, it's really hard to compete with Nintendo and their IPs. You got two of the biggest gaming mascots ever, a franchise that's hugely popular in worldwide media in general, characters in games that have defined their own genres, characters that have cult followings, and characters that are just outright adorable. I'm gonna be talking about this dude today. Kirby, Kirby, Kirby. You really can't go wrong with some Kirby. This dude has been around the block for quite some time, first debuting way back in 1992 when he was just a little white boy on a not-so-little Game Boy. He may have had his humble beginnings on the old Game Brick, but not long after he went through puberty, turned pink, and quickly became a staple to Nintendo. I don't know if that's how Kirby puberty works, but uh, I'm just gonna roll with it. Kirby just kept getting game after game every year, and before you knew it, he took his place as being one of the most popular Nintendo characters. Now, with Nintendo being very prevalent throughout my childhood, of course I knew who Kirby was. He was the pink flying blob from Smash. But I believe the first Kirby game I ever owned was Kirby Superstar Ultra from the Nintendo DS. And I loved it. It was definitely one of my top DS games in my library. Floating around, sucking up enemies, saving the world, it was just so simple. It was easy for a little tiny me to understand, and overall, it was just fun. And that's the beauty of Kirby. He appeals to so many people on so many different levels, gamers and non-gamers alike. And for the most part, Kirby has some of the most easygoing and enjoyable games in Nintendo's library. Bottom line is, Kirby just sucks. What, he's doing it right now. Kirby has been successful for a while, and he's really had little to no hiccups throughout the years. I mean, even these spin-offs are solid. Shoutouts to Kirby's Dream Course on Super Nintendo, that game is amazing. But one common complaint among the Kirby franchise I often hear is the lack of the third dimension. But with Kirby and the Forgotten Land being on Switch now, they finally came to their senses and made a game that resolved the 3D Kirby crisis, right? <laughs> Wrong. Nintendo actually already did that, way back in the year 2000 to be exact, back when Nintendo was obsessed with the number 64 for some strange reason. So ladies and gentlemen, say hello to Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards, released on June 26, 2000. With it being on the 64, actually, can I borrow that real quick? Yeah, no, yeah, sweet. Oh, man. Gosh, this is deep. Oh, jeez. There we go. With it being on the 64, the game is 3D, which actually makes it Kirby's first experience in a 3D space. It's somewhat nostalgic to me. Like quite a few retro games, I first played it on the Wii Virtual Console, and I specifically remember it being my favorite Kirby game. But it's been a hot minute since I've even touched this, and I've been meaning to take a look back on it for quite some time now. So I thought with all the Kirby talk floating around, I think it's about time I sat down and did just that. So honestly, I don't really want to waste any more time, uh, so let's take a look at Kirby's first 3D experience. 1996, Nintendo's third dimensional heyday. Everybody was making the jump to 3D. If a character had any mainline presence on the Super Nintendo, they were practically guaranteed for an adaptation to 3D. So obviously, characters like Mario and Link and Donkey Kong made their way onto the N64, but oddly enough, Nintendo's pink puffball was nowhere to be found. Kirby was just finishing up his successful career on the Super Nintendo with Kirby's Dream Land 3 released in 1997, a whole year after the N64 launched. So while literally every other Nintendo IP was making the big leap to 3D, Kirby was off to a late start. Development actually started not long after Dream Land 3. It was originally being developed for the N64 disk drive add-on, but eventually switched to the standard game pack due to the disk drive being a complete commercial flop. That, combined with Kirby's first steps and experimentation in 3D, the game went through a longer development cycle and was released way later in the 64's lifespan. Now, I wasn't around when the N64 launched, but seeing everyone else making the jump to 3D, I'm sure all the Kirby fans were dying to see what Nintendo had up their sleeves. It didn't help that Nintendo further emphasized that feeling because, fun fact, Kirby's actual first 3D appearance was in Super Smash Bros. in 1999. It was only a matter of time before Kirby would get his turn in the 3D spotlight. And just like that, just one year later after Smash, Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards was released to the public.
So here it is. I hope you're not sleeping after that history lesson. It's time to pop this baby in and experience Kirby 64 in all of its glory. Let us, uh, as the kids say, get this bread, shall we? Okay, so I'm not much of a big storyteller, so here's a quick recap just for some context. So there's this crystal, right, and these dark matter dudes want it. So this fairy, Ribbon, tries to fly away with this sacred crystal, and when making her escape, the dark matter chases her and shatters it, making her crash land on planet Popstar. There she meets Kirby, and he agrees to help collect all these shattered pieces across the galaxy because he's a good Christian boy, and boom! Kirby's got himself a grand old adventure! Now that we got that out of the way, let's go ahead and select a file here. Um, is my controller broken or something? Wait a minute. If I have to use this, does this mean Kirby 64 isn't actually 3D? I actually already knew this, but it still kind of sucks. Okay, this is getting old. Okay, so the game is technically 3D with its graphics, objects, and environments, yada yada yada, but when it comes to the gameplay though, well, that's a different story. At its core, it actually plays just like any other Kirby game, and while it's not full 3D gameplay, they opted to get as close as they could and do a 2.5D game instead, which basically means Kirby is still stuck on a 2D plane, but the environments and levels have full 3D depth to them. I feel like this game is kind of a black sheep in the Kirby franchise. It's weird because I feel like lots of people talk about it fondly for the most part, but yet I see no one talk about it beyond just saying, oh yeah, Kirby 64 is a great game. It's like people know it exists, and yeah. But with it not being a full 3D adventure, the game kind of gets lost in the shadows compared to most games on the 64. I think most people don't look at it as Kirby 64, and they more so remember it as just Kirby, but on the 64, if that makes sense. It plays just like any typical Kirby game, going level by level, sucking up enemies, copying their powers, and rarely dying. And just like most Kirby games, it's very simple and easy to pick up and play. But the main mechanic they introduced to make it stand out from the rest of Kirby's adventures is the ability to completely mix and combine powers. Out of all the Kirby games I've played, this is by far my favorite mechanic they've ever done. You're given two slots that you can fill with either two different power-ups to make one unique mix, or with two of the same powers to get a more enhanced version of said ability. This can be achieved by either sucking in two different enemy types, or by spinning up an already existing power you have on hand and throwing it at another enemy. I really love this mainly because of how fun and unique each one can get. You got powers that make Kirby turn into a bow shooting fiery arrows, powers that turn Kirby into a curling stone or a volcano, and there's a pretty big list of powers to mix and match. You have no idea how fun it is seeing a new mix of powers for the very first time just because they're so fun and charming and distinct from each other. Every time I would see two powers I haven't combined, I would get this little burst of excitement. Like, you can be a fridge, you can wield a lightsaber, it's just, it's just so good. The game constantly gives opportunities to create new combinations throughout your playthrough, and it's definitely the biggest highlight for me personally. Only problem with these combinations is I feel like most of them are way too overpowered. A lot of them make you feel invincible. Actually, scratch that, they do make you invincible. Look at this. This is literally a cakewalk. From what I saw, the game doesn't really give you a reason to switch powers. The only reason you would want to switch is simply for the interest in seeing what other powers are out there, and I mean, that's what I did. Now, I know most Kirby games are known for being on the easy side of things, but I feel like this is a bit overdoing it. I mean, when you have powers that not only make you invincible, but are strong enough to kill bosses in three hits, I think there needs to be a little more balance. The whole game in general is pretty much a walk in the park. Only a handful of bosses gave me somewhat of a challenge, and that's it. Again, most Kirby games usually get criticized for being way too easy, but I felt that to be true with this game especially. 
I get the appeal for games to have a casual experience, but it has to be entertaining enough for me to enjoy it. And while mixing and combining powers do a great job at doing that, they also make the gameplay a bit bland towards the end. With some powers, you kinda just hold right and walk through each stage untouched for the most part. While I really, really love the mixing mechanic, the power-ups feel a bit unbalanced. The mechanic itself isn't the issue, it's just the game being designed the way it is. I think it would have been nice if it was a little more balanced, maybe had some different incentives to use different mixes, but it's still my favorite aspect to the game, and visually it's so charming and fun seeing Kirby morph into so many different things. Like every Kirby game on the planet, the game is so stinking charming. Even some of the cutscenes make me laugh a little bit. I love the character designs and expressions, all the levels are very colorful and diverse. If there's one thing a Kirby game never gets wrong, it's the cuteness, and the same can be said about Kirby 64. The levels themselves are pretty good for the most part, nothing too extraordinary or crazy. Although one thing I did like was the different character sections they would throw in every once in a while. Along the adventure, you find some of Kirby's typical friends to help you out through the game. Characters like King DDD, Waddle Dee, and new to the cast, Adeline. A lot of these character sections are very simple in design, but are a really nice addition to some of these levels. Riding King DDD was a nice change of pace from the standard gameplay, and the on-rail Waddle Dee sections were pretty sweet too. Again, they're pretty bare bones, but it's nice to see that the Kirby cast was put to use in some capacity, and it's a nice addition that adds some variety to the game. Each level has lots of different themes and areas throughout the game, and with it being 2.5D, some places have cool depth and effects. However, I do think they could have taken advantage of this a little better. I saw this effect work the best mostly in the bosses, which were super sweet, but when it came to some of the standard levels, it wasn't really anything special. If I'm being honest, I felt like most of the time the levels felt pretty empty because of the depth they had. You see this in a lot of the outside areas, there's tons of open and empty space in the background, and it doesn't look the greatest. The effect looks best in enclosed areas like caves or buildings just because there's lots of less space you have to fill. But there are instances when the effect does look pretty sweet outside, like on the outskirts of King DDD's castle for example. The 2.5D graphics gets the job done, but I really do think it wasn't used to the fullest. Like I said, it's good in some places, but others? These just look so empty and bland. And for being a game that was released four years after the console launched, you would think the game would look a bit better than this. I will cut it some slack though and say 3D art was pretty primitive back then, but overall the visuals kind of vary level by level. Now I don't know if this was caused by the 3D depth or the controller I was using, but the game's controls felt clunky to me. Compared to most of Kirby's games up until this point, I never really felt this way, but for some reason the game feels pretty slow and pretty clunky in the later stages. Most Kirby games are very simple when it comes to movement and control, but the more I played, the more I noticed it wasn't the greatest. It could just be that I'm using a somewhat normal control scheme on the N64 controller, which in itself doesn't feel normal. But I think what it boils down to is the game having a slower pace. It's not like the levels themselves are super complex so the game requires precise movement or anything. I just really noticed it more and more as I progressed through the game. Well, the good news is I didn't really have to deal with it for long. The game is pretty short. <laughs> Actually, like, very short. <laughs> like, three hours long short. Yeah, this is probably one of the biggest downfalls the game has. The length is just way too short. I wasn't over-exaggerating when I said it was three hours long. It actually took me a little under three hours to beat it. Now, with that being said, I only did a casual playthrough of it. The game does try to make up for time by having you collect every crystal hidden throughout each level in the game for the quote-unquote good ending, but I wasn't having that. The first ending boss was good enough for me. Seriously though, that boss was pretty sick. I was surprised to see how short it was. Compared to its predecessors on the Super Nintendo, it's about the same length as them, and that's kind of underwhelming for an N64 game. When you think about the N64 upgrades other Nintendo characters had, it's kind of sad to see Kirby get the short end of the stick. They all had grand scope changes and length, while Kirby was converted into 3D models, and that's it. Not saying Kirby's core formula is bad by any means, but I think I'm not alone when saying 
I think Kirby deserved a little more love for his first 3D spotlight. I don't think the game is bad, I just feel like it's kinda disappointing. I can see some people liking the game for sticking to the Kirby formula, and I know lots of people like bite-sized experiences, but for me, I can't help but feel like this game was a little underdeveloped. From the graphical emptiness in some of the levels to the overall length of the game, it just seems like Kirby didn't get enough time in the oven for the Nintendo 64. Overall, I still enjoyed the game. The mixing and combining powers mechanic really carried it for me. I still think that is the best Kirby mechanic ever. But in terms of the game as a whole, I'm just not sure if it's really aged the best. The length, difficulty, and graphics could have been developed, balanced, and touched up a bit more. But again, I wouldn't really say it's a bad game. If you're looking for a bite-sized adventure with a unique ability mechanic, I would say give it a go. I want to thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed this video and want to support me in any way, just liking, sharing, and subscribing is super, super appreciated. But again, I just want to thank you guys for watching, and we'll hopefully see you guys here soon.